Welcome to our second tutorial on deep learning. We'll be looking at convolutional neural networks, and specifically convolutional neural networks in the context of natural language processing tasks. And so we'll be looking at one-dimensional convolutional neural networks in this case. Um, Two-dimensional CNNs are very common in things like image processing. Um, we'll touch on them briefly, um, but one-dimensional CNNs tend to be more useful in uh, both like speech and text processing because you often only have some linear set of data. Um, CNNs can be thought of as modifications of our original feed-forward network design, which we're going to take a quick second to review. For a quick review of our feed-forward networks, our feed-forward network is a set of weights that can take in some input dimension, usually with a um, corresponding um, size of the dimension it will be applied to. In our case, we're applying this feed-forward network transformation on the H or hidden dimension of our input, um, and then it will give some output dimension. So the input uh, weights have to correspond to the input of our hidden dimension, and the output will be generated based on how many uh, hidden units we have in our feed-forward network. In our case, we'll have two, so we have two outputs. Um, one thing to note about this is because the feed-forward network is applied evenly to all of um, the units in our tensor over this H dimension, um, it will build each of these um, output um, sets of cells independently. So whatever is in the input just gets directly transmuted into the output and the neighbors have no recollection of uh, what, who they're next to, so to speak. CNNs change this uh, by now allowing you to have some uh, ability to understand sequence data. And how CNNs allow you to do this is with the addition of some uh, kernel size, which gives you a width to the, um, to the weight tensor. So before we only had a say a width of one, um, and so we would only be able to apply to one time step at a time and independently for all time sets. Uh, now what we can do is say if our kernel size is three, um, we'll, uh, we'll take in um, three time steps um, at the same time to generate one output uh, part of the tensor. In our case, we have a similarly shaped input in that it is, again, a three-dimensional tensor. Um, we're going to have a length dimension now. Um, before, we had some what we called an other dimension. Now we're going to make this concrete and say it's the length of our input. This could be in a series of tokens, the first token, second token, third token, fourth token. Could be in an audio file where you'd have different time steps for the audio what have you. In our case, we're going to say that our length is actually four and just corresponds to the colored parts of our input tensor. The gray parts are padding. So those are things we've added just to make the input and output uh, sizes have roughly the same shape. So the padding will just be usually um, values of zero that get added um, and um, are just really there to, to balance the sizes. For our equivalent to the hidden dimension before, we'll now call this our number of in channels. Um, you can think of it basically the same way, though. Um, each of these channels can be un understanding a different aspect of our problem. Um, in the terms of audio processing, um, the channels might correspond to, say, um, different um, frequency outputs. If you're, say, putting in like a spectrogram as your input um, in the context of uh, word tokens and token embeddings, these 
channels might correspond to uh, different dimensions in the word embedding matrix. And finally, we again have a batch size. This just says we're looking at several different examples at once, and we want to keep each of these different uh, batches independent. So now how our CNN is going to apply, um, this is a two filter um, size three kernel CNN. Um, and so you can think of all of the blue side, blue parts as being connected. Um, these gray padding um, portions will be included, but since they're zero, they're really just there for um, the addition of a balanced weight. So we're going to take the first, um, the first two time steps plus this padding portion. Um, we'll essentially multiply that by our um, convolutional weights and then that will give us our uh, sliver of output. We then repeat this over the four different um, time steps that we have in our input and get the four different, uh, essentially, time steps in our output. Just like the feedforward network, we'll also have a nonlinearity applied after our convolution layer. Like the feedforward network, we can also stack these together. But what's interesting about stacking convolution networks is because each layer is going to have some um, receptive width that they'll be able to cover, um, you can actually cover more and more um, width of your original input by stacking uh, different convolution layers on top of each other until you're basically, you could be able to cover the entirety of your input and funnel that into um, your output. So let's look at the components of a CNN system. So we mentioned the kernel size. This is just the input width we'll be able to take in, a, in our case, our one dimensional CNN. Um, this is how many time steps around um, the input we can take. Um, Usually, because it's centered around a particular time step, you want to pick an odd number for the kernel. So three, five, seven um, are usually easy values to pick. Um, and then you'll have the same number on the left and the right of a given time step. So looking at how we can implement this in PyTorch, um, we can simply use this in an conv1d function, and all it needs to take is um, similar to the feedforward network, the size of your input, as well as what's essentially the size of your output, um, but then also you need to feed it uh, the size of the kernel that you want to apply. So this is a uh, one-dimensional CNN with an input size of three. Uh, it has five filters, which means it'll have five uh, output channels, and we'll have a kernel size of three that we're applying. Um, so applying this over a, an input tensor of batch size two, three channel, and um, a length of five, um, we'll get this sort of two, five, three output, where our five in the center is coming from the number of channels in our um, convolution. So we have five CNN filters, we get five channels out. Um, and mysteriously, um, we sort of drop down in the number of our length dimension, which we'll get to in a second. When we try this again with now a five kernel uh, CNN with the same number of inputs and filter size, we see that this now drops down to an output size of one. We've fully shrunken our input to just one output. This can be kind of awkward. If you keep stacking um, CNNs like this, you might actually run out of runway, so to speak, doing it this fashion. So a way around this is to use something called padding. So padding is that gray part in our diagram we mentioned earlier. They're just cells of zero that get added to the front and back of an input. Um, and we can use it to basically 
increase the um, the takeoff for our, our CNN model. The takeoff as in like a, a runway analogy. So now if we set um, padding um, to the easiest way is to just set it to our, our kernel size minus one divide by two. If you're picking an odd kernel size, that'll generally give you um, a padding that will balance the um, uh, balance that kernel, ignoring other things like um, like stride and dilation and stuff like that. Um, so if we can do this, now we'll end up having a same size input and output tensor when we do uh, a CNN. Uh, transformation on some data. A very effective tool in combination with um, CNNs is uh, to have pooling layers. And so uh, pooling layers allow you to only take the sort of best values um, from a given layer and then um, to compress that layer so you, you're only taking the best um, over some set. So I say best, um, in our case, we usually use something called max pooling. Um, and this will just identify the highest values in a certain chunk of your uh, input um, and just keep those highest values. Um, then your model will learn to generate high values in areas that are important um, and you can use that as a way to um, get your model to make um, good predictions while also being efficient and um, being able to compress the, um, the length dimension of your input as you pass it through your model. So that's a very useful property um, in that it allows you to speed up computation uh, or have um, layers that aren't um, applying on the full length all the way through. In speech processing, um, this is particularly useful if you want to do something like um, like uh, subsampling. Um, you can either do pooling like this, or you could do um, you can add uh, something to the stride so you're not taking every single input from one layer to the next layer. So when we look at how this applies to our to the shape as we pass some data through it. Um, if we have a 2320 uh, tensor that we pass through, um, the CNN is just going to change our uh, channel part of it. Um, and again, this is because we've kept um, some padding here to, to keep the length even before and after. Um, but now we can control the length with our max pulling layer. Um, and the easiest way to think about it is max pooling will divide the length by um, whatever the kernel size of the pooling kernel you use. Um, this is the sort of easiest way to think about it. Um, so if you have a max pooling with a kernel size of three, it'll apply that um, to every um, chunk of three uh, parts of your input. Um, and so it'll divide the whole thing up by three or by, say, if it's kernel size of five, then you're dividing it by five. Finally, um, one handy variant of this is something called adaptive max pooling. And what adaptive max pooling does is it says uh, over the entire length, um, just keep the, the highest values over each of the um, channels. And so it sort of compresses the entire length into just one time step. Um, you can then uh, squeeze that last time step. And in the context of PyTorch, that means basically just get rid of any um, any dimension that has just one, um, one value in it. So anything that's sort of like a, um, not really any extra data stored on it. So you can use this at the end of your um, your CNN models to compress and then have one tensor, um, usually like a two-dimensional tensor that you can pass to your, um, your classification layer.
So we're going to put this together in the context of a, a movie review classification task. So like the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, um, these are a bunch of um, a bunch of texts that have been classified as being either positive or negative. Um, in the case of these IMDb remove, uh, movie reviews, though, they're much, much longer than the um, sentiment tree, back, tree bank um, texts. So these are actually more like paragraphs. Um, and we're going to see if um, our CNN model is able to handle them through our training. So we're, again, just going to apply similar data uh, preparation techniques. So we're going to grab um, the tor tech, torch text um version of this IMDB um, data set. We're going to split it into a train and development uh, set. Um, we can look at one of these examples. So it has um, a label as well as the actual task. Uh, so again, much longer than our uh, sentences before. We'll tokenize it in the same way as before. Um, but this time, we're going to set some minimum frequency for our vocabulary. Um, this is just saying keep any word that you see more than five times. Um, having a max vocabulary versus having a minimum frequency are two sort of ways you can set a vocabulary. Um, they may work better or worse depending on your um, particular task you're working on. So always be careful about experimenting with these sorts of uh, parameters. We'll tokenize things in the in a similar way by having a torch text transform that we just pass all of the input through. Um, this time we're also going to include a transform for the labels since they're not given to us as uh, binary zero one. Uh, we'll ap apply this to make our um, train and dev data loaders. Um, and then we can print it out just to make sure the tensors look right. So we have our labels in the first part um, and then our padded um, batches of text in the second part. Uh, we see all of the padding at the end here. And again, this is sort of a, um, a transposed matrix where each column represents a single sentence. Um, and um, we have um, in number, I get 16 um, different sentences uh, across the row. Uh, we'll use our same training code, um, but now we can get into our new model. I'm going to just use some handy functions. These are things that aren't uh, particularly uh, meaningful. They're just uh, easy ways to apply um, a particular um, torch function uh, through a loop. So um, our, our first one is just going to apply the permute function, and the second one was just going to apply a squeeze function, which we talked about before. Um, by pus putting it in this in in module class style, um, I can add it directly on like a uh, in in sequential or in in module list, um, which means it can just be passed through uh, along with the rest of our layers. Now looking at our confnet, um, what we're going to have is similar to our feed for a network. We'll take in an output size, number of layers we want to generate. Um, instead of a um, like hidden size, we'll now have number of channels we want our CNN layers to have. Um, we'll have a kernel size that they can apply. And again, this is the, the width that each CNN is going to look at when it's um, calculating outputs for the next layer. Um, the vocab size is going to be taken directly from our um, vocab that we generated earlier. The embedding size, again, just says how much, um, how many values do we want to use to store information about the tokens in our text. And then finally, dropout will be used again. So 
I'm going to use this handy convention, which is to have a modulus and then shove everything one by one onto the modulus. And then that makes my feed forward look very easy because I can just loop through every item on the list. So um, very easy feed forward network um, at the expense of just you need to pay attention to what's getting added one by one onto it. We'll use ReLU again, um, and we'll use um, just a fixed uh, max pooling um, of kernel size two. So each time it sees this max pooling, it'll get the length will get divided in two. Um, the permute modules here are simply there to deal with um, input dimension um, issues to make sure things pass through correctly. So um, our CNN is going to want um, uh, inputs and in size um, batch channel and then the length. And this is just ensuring that it's getting that right um, dimensions prior to being fed into the convolution layer. Um, so again, we'll have one uh, layer to start off to make sure that it's getting the right dimensions in from our embedding layer, um, but then the rest will be looped through um, in uh, this fashion that we used with the feed for network, network as well. One thing to mention before we go on is we're using embedding instead of uh, in an dot embedding bag. The difference between the two is that embedding bag will compress everything into a single um, summary uh, versus embedding keeps the length dimension in your um, of your uh, input. So all it does is take your input tokens and then trans transfer them into some embedding space. Um, back to our layers. So for each of the layers that I'm going to make, we'll pop on a convolution, a nonlinearity, a pooling layer, and a dropout. Um, the order of the nonlinearity, well, yeah, the order of pooling and dropout doesn't really matter. Those can switch around. Uh, potentially, maybe has some issue um, if you apply the nonlinearity non before or after the pooling. However, that's speaking that, um, generally speaking, um, it's not going to matter much because uh, larger values will still be uh, larger after the nonlinearity. Um, so it'll still pick the same values uh, before or after the pooling. Um, last bit, when we get to our outputs, we're going to apply adaptive max pooling to squeeze everything down into one time step. Um, we will get rid of that extra dimension that we just squeezed everything to, um, and then we'll apply uh, output linear classification layer. So this is just going to say, um, since we've gotten rid of um, the time dimension in our inputs, we can just take our um, 2D tensor, which is a batch by channel um, dimension ten tensor, and now push that into a batch by output size tensor, where output size is the number of uh, classes in our in our task. Uh, in our case, it's just two, so um, this doesn't really matter too much. Um, and then finally, we'll apply softmax, which again just normalizes things into a probability distribution. Setting things up in the same way, training wise as last time, we'll use um, stochastic gradient descent, um, and then as our optimizer, and then cross entropy loss as our loss function. Um, before I actually needed to apply momentum for our 
um, our feed forward network to classify things well. Um, in this case, I actually was able to run SGD without momentum. It would probably be improved if I added momentum here, but um, you can play around with that yourself to see how well you can get these models to function. Note, one other really easy thing to improve a model is often playing around with the optimizer. Um, there's different fancier optimizers um, that can potentially get your model fully trained faster, um, usually with limited or if no, um, no downside to the performance. Um, SGD is generally a very good choice if you are, um, if you want sort of a classic training algorithm. I'm going to just print out the layers just to see what um, we popped onto our module list. So um, we have our embedding layer. We're going to get the tensor dimensions swapped around to make sure they're the correct for our, our convolution layer. We'll apply one convolution followed by a nonlinear activation function. And then we'll pop on another convolution. Again, ReLU. This time we'll have a max pooling layer, have some dropout, and then another layer of a uh, combination of a convolution, ReLU, max pool, and dropout. So you can think of it as sort of one input layer followed by two full layers that have max pulling attached to them, and then a final adaptive max pulling layer to squeeze everything down into one time step. We then apply our uh, output projection and then take soft max. So we'll train this in the same way, and it took about 15 minutes to train on my sort of weak uh, laptop GPU. So we again start off with 50%. Reasonable, considering it's a binary classification task, um, but then we quickly sort of peak out at um, around 80% uh, once it's been training for a while. Um, training looks pretty good. Our loss is dropping across the course of our training. Um, and we go up to about five epochs before our validation and train accuracies start diverging. Um, and our final validation accuracy, again, plateaus around 80%. This is it for CNNs. Um, we will be looking at a more advanced way to deal with sequence data next uh, using something called recurrent neural networks.